Hi, I'm Brian Schwedak, a fifth year PhD student in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon. And I'm going to talk about how to build a general purpose architecture that enables a wide range of data movement optimizations and software on a single hardware platform. This work was done at Carnegie Mellon in collaboration with my advisor, Nathan Beckman, and undergraduate students, Piratak Uvidya and Jennifer Siebert. Our work is motivated by the increasing cost of data movement. Computer systems have evolved significantly over time, from cores directly accessing memory to complex multi-level distributed memory hierarchies. This has made data movement increasingly expensive. This graph plots energy on log scale for an arithmetic operation and different types of data movement. As you can see, data movement is orders of magnitude more expensive than compute, and the trend is worsening over time. Of course, we aren't the first people to realize this. There are literally more than 100 proposals for specialized memory hierarchies in recent architecture conferences, including graph optimizations, non-uniform cache architectures, and pointer chasing accelerators, just to name a few. Clearly, there's a big opportunity here because these optimizations often give more than 2x speed up. But there is a huge problem. Each of these optimizations requires adding their own custom hardware, which is disruptive across the system stack and prohibitively expensive due to hardware design and verification costs. Realistically, systems are just not going to have dozens of specialized ASICs within the memory hierarchy. This is a huge lost opportunity though, because systems cannot realize these potential gains. That leads us to the motivating question for this work. How can we specialize the memory hierarchy without requiring custom hardware for each new optimization? Fundamentally, we realize that the problem is the memory interface, and it's the reason prior work was forced to use custom hardware. On current systems, software can only perform loads and stores, which was fine for older systems with direct memory access, but as we already saw, systems are now much more complex with distributed multi-level cache hierarchies, yet we still use the same load store interface. Hence, prior designs were forced to add custom hardware within the hierarchy to optimize data movement because the memory interface gave them no other choice. The thesis behind our system is that the increasing importance of data movement motivates an increasing need to expose data movement to software. So optimizations that previously required specialized hardware can now run entirely in software on a single general purpose platform. Taco achieves this by adding general purpose engines that run software within the hierarchy, eliminating the need for new hardware for each new optimization. We call this a polymorphic cache hierarchy because it lets software change the functionality of the hierarchy to match the application's needs. Taco gives a practical path to memory hierarchy specialization so that software can directly address the growing cost of data movement. Taco's key mechanism is that hardware notifies software when data moves and lets software intervene by observing and modifying the data. With Taco, loads and stores work normally for most data. But Taco adds this new notion of phantom data, which is data that lives only within the cache. When the core loads phantom data, an on-miss software callback is invoked on the engine to fill in the phantom data. Subsequent accesses to the data hit in the cache like normal. And when phantom data is evicted from the cache, either an on-eviction or on write-back callback is invoked, depending on whether the data is dirty. These callbacks let software operate on data as it moves, which we found is a common pattern needed by prior specialized hierarchies that's not supported by current systems. In particular, prior near-data computing designs do not provide this capability. They merely offload compute from cores closer to data. This might reduce data movement, but does not enable the kinds of optimizations we see in prior specialized hierarchies. Instead, Taco takes inspiration from work done in the 90s on programmable memory hierarchies, which expose more data movement to software. However, those systems were responding to the trend towards multiprocessing and focus on optimizing the coherence protocol to improve the performance of loads and stores. In contrast, Taco is responding to the trend towards hardware specialization and is designed to implement entirely new semantics in the cache hierarchy. In Taco, caches trigger software, not cores. Intercepting cache misses and evictions is the critical mechanism that lets software observe and control data movement, which is missing from prior systems. That wraps up our intro to Taco. Now we will go over a quick motivating example. Then I'll describe Taco's design and present a few more results. We're going to start with a simple example that shows Taco callbacks in action and introduces its main components. This example focuses on a lossy compression scheme where an object is constructed from a base and delta. And unlike the conventional base plus delta scheme, values are approximate of the originals. Lossy compression schemes are attractive because they can increase compression ratio. Now, let's talk about different ways one might implement this compression scheme. 
On current systems, if an application wants to access the decompressed data, it needs to load the compressed data from memory into the core and then perform the decompression. The benefit of compression here is reduced memory and cache usage since only the compressed data is stored. However, if there is temporal reuse on the data, the core needs to repeatedly decompress the same data, wasting time and energy. So what about hardware compressed caches? They decompress data within the cache hierarchy so that higher levels of cache contain the decompressed data. This allows applications to benefit from temporal locality by keeping decompressed data only in the private cache. Unfortunately, not only is the compression scheme fixed in hardware, but hardware-only compressed caches just cannot support lossy compression. This is because hardware doesn't know which data can tolerate approximation. Now let's look at Taco. Here, the application loads phantom data corresponding to the decompressed data it wants to access. When a load to phantom data misses in the private cache, Taco invokes an on miss callback in software to decompress the data and store it in the private cache. Unlike hardware compressed caches, the application tells Taco exactly which data can tolerate loss of compression and other data is not affected. And since the callbacks are implemented in software, any compression scheme can be implemented without requiring new hardware for each one. Let's now see how Taco performs on this example. We evaluate an application which computes an average over an array of compressed data, which is accessed using a skewed Zipfian distribution. The baseline decompresses data at the core on each access. The first graph shows the number of decompressions performed, the second graph shows relative speed up, and the last graph shows relative energy. We first evaluate a near data computing version, which offloads decompression to the L2 cache. It actually performs worse than the baseline because decompressing data at the L2 loses locality provided by the L1. In contrast, Taco achieves significant speed up and energy savings by decompressing data only once when there's a cache miss. Caches then capture reuse of popular data to avoid decompressing the same data repeatedly. Finally, we compare against Taco with an ideal engine that has infinite compute. Taco is close to ideal because performance is not from raw compute. It's about using data movement to know when to compute. Popping up a level, Taco provides these benefits by triggering compute in response to data movement. As we saw in the decompression example, simply offloading compute into the memory hierarchy, like in prior near data computing designs, does not provide the same functionality. Taco provides this missing mechanism. By opening up the cache hierarchy to software, Taco enables a wide range of optimizations using a single general purpose architecture. Now that we've motivated the need for expanding the memory interface, let's see how Taco achieves this. Taco's two main components are the programming interface and the architecture. Taco's programming interface is currently designed for expert programmers and consists primarily of three callbacks. OnMIS fills in a phantom cache line when it is first accessed, as we saw in the decompression example. On eviction and on writeback, until the eviction of clean and dirty data respectively. And that's basically it. We found that these three callbacks cover a wide range of different optimizations. An application uses Taco by creating what we call a morph. A morph is a data type which implements the three callbacks. Programmers write a morph subclass, then call a register method with the morph, the cache level to execute the callbacks, either the L2 or the LLC, and the size of the phantom address range to allocate. Multiple instances of the same morph type can be registered at the same time, but on distinct addresses. An application may also register different types of morphs, but still on distinct addresses. That covers Taco's programming interface. In this next section, we will look at Taco's hardware. Taco starts with a baseline multi-core processor. On each tile, Taco adds an engine to execute callbacks. The engine's main components are a hardware scheduler and data flow fabric. The scheduler spawns threads entirely in hardware without going through the operating system, and the data flow fabric runs the callbacks. To see how Taco works, let's walk through how Taco executes an on-miss callback on phantom data at the L3. A core loads phantom address A, which misses in the L3. The cache controller checks that the address is registered with Taco, so it spawns a thread to run the callback. OnMIS then fills in the data, which is returned to the core when the callback ends. Subsequent loads to address A hit the L1 like normal. And when data is evicted from the L3 cache, Taco will similarly execute an on writeback callback. The tags indicate that the address is registered, so after the child caches are invalidated, the controller invokes on writeback on the data. Once the callback completes, the data is evicted from the cache. And that covers the typical life cycle of a phantom cache line. Taco adds a small amount of state to track which lines of callbacks registered and to perform address translation, which adds less than 3% state compared to the L3 cache. 
Our data flow fabric is similar to many prior data flow designs. It's an array of simple processing elements that use dynamic data flow firing to issue operations when their inputs are available. Overall, the fabric adds approximately 3% area overhead compared to the L3 cache. We found that data flow fabrics were a good fit for Taco engines for a few reasons. First, the most important is that callbacks need memory level parallelism to perform well, which data flow engines provide, unlike in order cores, which have been used in some prior near data computing designs. Second, Taco callbacks tend to be short, so they easily fit on a small fabric overcoming one of the main limitations of data flow architectures. And there are several more reasons discussed in the paper. But in general, we found that data flow engines work very well for Taco, and in particular, provide up to 3x end-to-end -end speed up compared to an in-order core due largely to memory level parallelism. That wraps up Taco's design. Now we'll demonstrate the full potential of a polymorphic cache hierarchy through more case studies. We evaluate Taco in cycle accurate simulation. Our system consists of 16 tiles each with an out-of-order core and a TACO engine. In total, we evaluate five different case studies, but I only have time to go over three for this talk. We already looked at the decompression study, so we'll look at two more, starting with the example that redefined the cache to exhibit push semantics and finishing with an example that detects cache side channel attacks. Our next example shows how TACO can fundamentally change how the memory hierarchy behaves. Graph algorithms exhibit a common pattern called scatter updates, where each vertex needs to update all its outgoing neighbors. Unfortunately, cache hierarchies are bad at scatter updates due to the pull-based nature of current caches, which bring in data from lower levels when there's a miss, leading to wasted bandwidth and extra synchronization. Phi is a previously proposed specialized hierarchy that changes the memory hierarchy from pull-based semantics to push-based. When a core updates data, instead of loading data from memory, Phi buffers the update in the cache. Subsequent updates are coalesced in the cache, and updates are only applied when evicted. Finally, depending on the number of buffered updates in the cache line, the updates are either applied directly to the data or are logged for later processing, which improves spatial locality. Phi is very easy to implement with Taco's callbacks. An application starts by registering a morph at the L3 cache for vertex data. On a cache miss, on miss provides a zeroed out cache line. Subsequent updates are simply written to buffered phantom lines. When a line is evicted, on write back checks the content of the line to decide whether to apply the updates in place or log them for later using the same logic as phi. So we've now implemented push semantics in software. And importantly, this is not possible without Taco since software cannot respond to cache insertions and evictions using only loads and stores. The Taco version of phi replicates the conclusions from the original phi paper. The first graph shows normalized memory accesses, the second graph shows speed up, and the last graph shows energy. The software baseline always applies updates in place. Alternatively, we have a software implementation that always logs updates. Logging reduces memory accesses and gets some speed up. Then we have Taco, which decides dynamically whether to apply updates in place or log them, reducing memory accesses further to achieve even better speed up. Further, Taco is close to ideal because, as with the decompression example, compute is not the bottleneck. Our final case study focuses on a different aspect of Taco's benefits. It shows how providing an application full visibility into the cache hierarchy, for example, where state is located, can provide new features beyond just performance and energy efficiency. This case study shows how applications can detect the common prime and probe cache side channel attack with Taco. I'll start by demonstrating how the prime and probe attack works. The threat model is an attacker trying to detect when a victim accesses a target cache set. Initially, the victim loads some of its sensitive data into the cache. The attacker starts by priming the cache set with garbage data, which evicts the victim's data and is invisible to the victim on current systems. The attacker then waits for the victim to access its sensitive data. Finally, the attacker probes its data and checks how long each load takes. If any access misses to memory, the long latency informs the attacker of an access to the target set, leaking sensitive information. Taco can detect and interrupt these kinds of attacks by notifying the victim when the attacker primes the cache before any sensitive data is leaked. Let's see how the prime and probe attack looks in practice. This graph shows a trace of evictions from different sets of a shared cache bank. The victim performs an AES encryption, incurring some evictions. The attacker then primes the target set, evicting the victim's data. The next encryption by the victim evicts the attacker's prime data, leaking sensitive information. So when the attacker probes the set, they detect an access from the victim extracting information about the AES key. Now, let's look at the same cache eviction trace with Taco. 
Once again, the victim performs an AES encryption. However, this time when the attacker primes the cache on eviction is triggered, detecting the attack before any data can be leaked from probing. This example demonstrates an entirely different class of benefits from the other case studies. Instead of optimizing for performance, this application uses Taco to gain visibility into the cache hierarchy. Such feedback from hardware to software is simply not possible with the traditional memory interface. I only showed a subset of the case studies evaluated in the paper, so please check the paper for more interesting examples using Taco as well as sensitivity studies. To wrap up, we've seen that the current memory interface severely limits application performance and functionality as data movement becomes increasingly expensive. A wide range of specialized hierarchies try to circumvent this issue by incorporating custom hardware, but this is not a practical solution. Taco addresses the issue head on by opening the cache hierarchy to software, enabling new optimizations that are impossible on current systems. Thank you.